disease prevention and therapeutics. So without further ado, I would like, uh, uh, I'm very pleased to invite John Durber to talk about papillomavirus life cycle. John. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so I've got a different background than the previous speakers really, and uh, our interest has always been from a virology perspective and trying to understand how the virus works. So what I'm going to do is try and give you some general concepts, some general ideas about how papillomaviruses work and how they can sometimes cause disease, which may be useful when you're considering the different clinical manifestations that you come across. So let's start by taking a look at the virus particle. Of course, viruses are parasites. Papillomaviruses are no different. They're intracellular parasites. They have to get inside a cell to cause disease. Of course, papillomaviruses are very simple uh, viruses. They just have a protein shell, and inside here is a circle of DNA, which is an infectious material which causes the disease. Now, you can get a lot of ideas about how papillomaviruses work by considering their origin. So I just really want to briefly go back in time to where papillomaviruses have come from. And we know that papillomaviruses are very ancient viruses. They've been with us and our ancestors for many hundreds of millions of years. In fact, their origins are thought to be around 350 million years ago, a time when dinosaurs were around. And they've evolved with their various hosts as evolution has driven speciation. And what we've ended up with, papillomaviruses and a whole range of different species now, from reptiles through to mammals. They all infect differentiated epithelium, but one of the typical characteristics of viruses which have evolved slowly where they're hosts is they usually don't cause a particular problem for the host. They've evolved very gently with the host over millions of years, and they're well adapted to the host. So you find that many papillomaviruses don't cause apparent disease, and this is really uh, built into their, their ancestry. Now, of course, we're interested particularly in the human papillomaviruses and the diseases they cause, and of course, you know there are many different types of human papillomaviruses now approaching 200. Now these are divided into five evolutionary groups, alpha, beta, gamma, mu, and nu. And these different papillomaviruses have different disease associations. Now they're often called low-risk and high-risk papillomaviruses. And the low-risk papillomaviruses, such as type 6 and 11, typically cause benign lesions, lesions which don't progress to cancer. So the low-risk viruses don't cause cancer, but of course they can cause very problematic disease, such as genital water laryngeal papillomas, which are very difficult to treat and often associated with problems of recurrence even after treatment. Now when we're thinking about what papillomaviruses do, I mentioned that many of them don't cause apparent disease. Now many of them, in fact the majority of them are actually low-risk. Very few are associated with cancers relatively to the large number which exist. So if we just look at these other groups, HPV type 1 and 4 typically cause verrucas, plantar warts on the soles of the feet. HPV 2 and 57, members of the alpha group, cause, palma, uh, cause common warts. These are typical in children. These are benign lesions which don't progress to anything more serious than the lesions shown in this picture. Now, the papillomaviruses are very sensitive to their environment. Although children get these type of lesions and resolve them spontaneously as a result of a cell-mediated immune response, in different genetic backgrounds, even these viruses can be problematic. So this is a very well-known individual who suffers from uncontrolled HPV2 infections. This is a guy who's been on the Discovery Channel, known as the Tree Man. These are HPV2. We don't know what his genetic abnormality is. Because of the limited treatments for papillomaviruses, this guy is treated by surgery to remove these lesions. Now, if we just look now at the high-risk viruses, these are the viruses which are particularly important for this audience. We know that HPV 16 and 18 are the most significant ones. 16 and 18 cause the majority of cervical disease. And most of my talk is really going to focus on cervical disease and genital infections, because we understand the life cycle of these sites much better than other sites. But of course, these viruses are very prominent in the general population, and they cause inapparent lesions in the majority of individuals who are infected. So this is a penile lesion associated with viruses such as 16 and 18. They can be visualized in the clinic by the application of dilute acetic acid. And as a sexually transmitted virus, they cause inapparent lesions in men as well as women. So these viruses are very prominent in the general population. There's an 80% life cycle, 80% life, life um, chance of being infected at some stage during your life, but most lesions are spontaneously resolved by the host immune system. These are, in effect, benign lesions. These are, in effect, the place where these viruses complete their life cycle. These are the HV 1618 comparable lesion to the genital warts or the common warts I've shown for the other viruses. 
Now, when we think about papillomaviruses and disease, we know that a subset of these lesions will persist, and in patients which have persistent HV16 infections, there is a risk of progression through neoplasia to cancers. And we also know the site is very important. The site of infection really matters a lot. It's not just about the virus, it's about the site of infection. So if we look at this type of a, a data here, we find that HPV, HPV caused the vast majority, almost 100% of cervical cancers, which is about half a million cases a year worldwide. But relatively few penile cancers, it's about 40 or 50,000 cases of these a year worldwide, of which half are associated with HPVs. The site of infection matters. It's a problem of the virus and a particular site, which leads to neoplasia and cancer progression. And we know from looking at the cervix that there are various different types of epithelial sites in the cervix. In fact, the cervix is a complex uh, mixture of different epithelial sites. And the most cervical cancers arise from this region called the transformation zone. And it's been suggested by recent publications, particularly these two by Herfs et al., so there are a particular group of cells, the junctional cells of the origin, which is maybe where some cervical cancers arise, and maybe also glandular cells. That these are particular sites where the virus doesn't actually regulate its gene expression properly. And as I'll come on to later, inappropriate regulation of the viral gene expression is really the first problem that the virus produces, which will eventually lead to neoplasia and cancers. Now, over the years, we've developed a series of uh, animations for training purposes such as this. And now they've become quite sophisticated. So this is the animation, and now we have a whole range of pull-down options to try and explain different aspects of the virus life cycle. And I'm going to try and show you one or two of these uh, different uh, parts of this movie to illustrate points in the papillomavirus life cycle. So this is a picture of cervical epithelium, and this is a H&E picture. And if we start it animated, we can see basically what happens when the virus has to infect. So if we just look at any type of epithelium, which is the target site for a papillomavirus, it works something like this. This is the dermis. This is the epidermis. The epidermis is maintained by the division of cells in the base of the layer or very near to the base of the layer. As the normal epithelial cells in the basal and parabasal cells divide, they produce daughter cells which are pushed towards the epithelial surface. They push towards the epithelial surface because these cells continue to divide. As they move towards the epithelial surface, they will go through a process of terminal differentiation. They will exit the size cycle and prepare to die in a controlled manner. And as they prepare to this, this final differentiation state in cell death, they will produce lipids, they will produce particular keratins, they will produce a cornified envelope. And in effect, they make the cell barrier, the, the epithelial cell barrier. Now, the virus lives in this epithelial site. And it's generally considered that the virus has to, in some way, gain access to the epithelial base layer. And often, this is thought to be in the way of a micro trauma, some sort of micro wound. The virus gets down to the base of the lamina, and it's generally thought that the virus adheres to the base of the lamina. As the wound repairs, the virus particle adheres to the epithelial cell, and the viral DNA enters the epithelial cell. And the viral DNA sets itself up in the basal cell at a low copy number as a viral episome. Typically 100, 50, 200 copies, a low copy number. Now, this original infection of the epithelial cell may allow the virus to get into a single epithelial cell, and it's thought that the wound healing environment, and possibly also the expression of the viral E67 proteins, which can drive cell proliferation, can allow this single infected cell to become a layer of infected cells, infected cells on the epithelial surface. This is now the reservoir infection where the virus lives. Now, for a lesion to be produced, the virus depends on differentiation. So this reservoir of infected cells with viral episomes, as they now move towards the surface, trigger different stages in the virus life cycle. So in the lower layers of the epithelium, the virus drives cell proliferation. As the cell moves towards the surface of the epithelium, a different set of proteins become expressed, including E4 and E2 and E1, which allow amplification of the viral DNA from 50 to 100 copies to many thousands of copies. So the virus is undergoing genome amplification. As the virus moves further towards the epithelial surface, the expression of the viral coproteins occurs, and the viral genomes, which are amplified here to thousands of copies, become packaged into particles. And these virus particles are released from the epithelial surface. So this is the normal viral life cycle. This is the life cycle, actually, of a high-risk papillomavirus, because the way I've drawn it, we're maintaining cell proliferation in the lower layers here. Maintenance of cell proliferation in the lower layers would be classified, I guess, by a pathologist as a neoplasia. 
So this is the sort of thing that HPV-16 might produce. Our current thinking is that not all viruses work quite like this, and the low-risk viruses such as HPV-11 maintain their viral genomes in the basal layer, but don't maintain cell proliferation of the basal layer. So they, they maintain themselves with very limited viral gene expression down here, but they still undergo amplification in the upper layers. Viral gene expression is initiated in these layers to allow the copy number to go from 50 copies to hundreds of copies, and virus particles are produced. So whether there's a benign wart like this, or a neoplasia, as I showed in the previous image, the amount of virus particles produced from the surface can be very similar. The question of why the high-risk viruses are able to drive cell proliferation in the lower layers, like this, still remains a bit of an unanswered question. Now, at certain epithelial sites, the idea that these neoplasias, this, this expression of the viral genes can become deregulated. And instead of the viral expressing its genes in a defined order, which leads to virus production, virus gene expression can be deregulated. And we get a, an inappropriate expression of genes such as E67, which allow the neoplastic cells to proliferate higher and higher into the, towards the epithelial surface. And these are classified by pathologists as different grades of neoplasia. And eventually it's thought that the continued expression of proteins such as E6 and E7 in the base layer and their effect on cellular proteins facilitates the accumulation of genetic errors in the infected cell, which eventually leads to a change in the cell phenotype and to cancer progression. So that's our current model of how the virus causes neoplasia and how persistent high-grade neoplasia can lead to cancers. Now, if I just go back to the animations, what I showed you is this very simple model now of the virus getting in to a stratified epithelial surface and producing a lesion, such as a low-grade neoplasia. But we have to now think that the different sites of infection and the different viruses that I mentioned have slightly different ways of working. And of course, there's a possibility that the virus can get into cells of the transformation zone, either junctional cells, columnar cells, or reserve cells, and the virus lesions may actually occur in a different way. And of course, when we think at other epithelial sites, such as the tonsils or the base of the tongue, there may be systems like this in operation, which allow the virus to produce higher grade neoplasias without going through these uh, earlier stages of productive infection. So what sort of evidence do we have from this? I just want to show you one or two research pictures now. This is a cone biopsy of a lesion, a CIN2+, which had HPV-16-51 in it. And if we just look at this, we've got areas of apparently uninfected epithelium here, areas of SYN2+, here on the histology, and areas of apparent proliferation in the gland. If we switch this to a molecular stain, this is an MCM stain. This is just a marker of cell proliferation. What we see is the lesional areas are shown very, very nicely in red here by the, any sort of cell cycle marker, MCM just being one of the ones we use. And when we're trying to identify where HPV 16 and 51 is in this lesion, well, we can use laser capture approaches to cut out specifically region and identify what virus is where. Particularly important to us is this region here, which looks to be a little area of proliferation in a gland associated with HPV 16, because we enlarge this at the histology. We find that the model of entry through a stratified epithelium doesn't really appear to be the case in this case. We've got a little area of proliferation associated with HPV-16 here in the context of a glandular epithelium. And I guess this may be the infection of a glandular cell, a reserve cell, or a junctional cell. But it doesn't seem to be infection through a stratified epithelial layer. Now, when we're thinking about how the virus can cause different types of neoplasia, we can get some answers by looking at tissue biopsies like this, but we can also get some answers by looking at models of disease. And one of the models we use in the lab is this one, which is a raft culture model. So in this system, what we do here is we put a particular virus type we're interested in, in this case HPV-16, into a keratinocyte, into a skin cell, an epithelial cell, or into an epithelial cell line. And we get epithelial cells with a virus type in. So here we've put HPV-16 into keratinocytes, and then we've differentiated those keratinocytes in a raft culture system at an air-liquid interface. And we've got two different phenotypes. One looks a bit like a SYN2 on a pathology level. One looks a bit like a low-grade disease. And we've stained these with the markers, the markers I just showed. The red here is MCM, marks cells in proliferation. And you can see in this one, there's a lot of cells in cycle, and the cells are quite densely packed. In this one, there are very few cells in the basal layer in cycle. 
The green marker is a viral marker which indicates where viral genome amplification is occurring. It's a marker E4, it's a viral protein. So this proves that the virus is active in these lesions. If we look at the E6, E7 protein on a Western blot, on a, just to look at the levels and how things are different, where well, if we look here and look at the amount of E6, E7 protein produced here, it's actually relatively low, and there's very little cell proliferation being stimulated. If we look in this one here and look at the amount of E6 and E7, it's comparatively high, and there's a lot of cell proliferation. We get the idea that differences in viral gene expression underlie phenotype, at least in model systems like this. Now, if we go back to lesions, this is now a lesion stained with one of those markers, again, MCM, and we can see basically a similar sort of situation. This is a, an area of normal uninfected epithelium, and there's very little cell cycle activity except very near to the base layer. This is an area of low-grade disease, and you can see the cells are not particularly densely packed, and there's a border here between this region of higher-grade disease. If we put on the marker of life cycle completion, E4, we can see how this differs. You get the impression from this that the virus really, to complete a productive life cycle, have to order itself very, very precisely with very carefully controlled gene expression. And things can potentially go wrong, neoplasia can potentially develop when deregulated expression occurs. And we get the idea that perhaps there are good and bad epithelial sites, and there are sites where gene expression is inappropriately regulated and sites where gene expression is correctly regulated. Now, one of the spin-offs of understanding the life cycle of this level of detail comes when we're considering diagnostic markers. I just want to show you one or two of the pictures we've produced. So this is now a single tissue section, and we can stain them with a whole range of diagnostic markers, one after the other. So let's take a look at this. This is the particular H&E picture I showed before, the uninfected epithelium here, this low-grade disease here, and the higher-grade disease here. This is the P16 stain which is a surrogate of overexpressed E6, E7, I guess, in most cases. This is a cell cycle marker, MCM, again, which is, in effect, a surrogate of E6, E7 activity when it's found in neoplasias like this. And this is the viral E4 protein, which appears as the cell cycle subsides. And by combining these, we can get an idea that maybe we can consider molecular pathology methods as an alternative to diagnosis when compared with conventional pathology. Now, I just want to move on to the final talk and just come to one of the areas of, uh, of particular interest in the field, which has interested us, that what happens when lesions regress? And do virus genomes actually disappear or do they persist? So I'm a bit nervous about presenting this with Margaret in the audience, but it's a very rudimentary uh, vision of how latency might come about from our observations in, in, in an animal model, the rabid oral papillomavirus. So if we just start with a lesion like this, this is a low-grade neoplasia caused by HV16. I think the general thinking is that the Langerhans cells, which patrol the epithelium, actually are involved in trying to identify uh, disease areas. And that the Langerhans cells, although the virus tries hard to avoid detection by the Langerhans cells, the Langerhans cells can eventually pick up viral antigens, take them to the lymph node, and stimulate a T-cell response in the standard way uh, in which Langerhans cells usually work or dendritic cells usually work. Now, these activated T cells will eventually return to the area of virus infection. They will accumulate under the lesional area and some of them will infiltrate the lesion. And from our study of animal models, what seems to happen during regression is that lymphocytes accumulate around the, viral, the area of viral infection. And the, rather than the massive amount of cell death, viral gene expression seems to decline when the lymphocytes infiltrate. And the suggestion is maybe the changes in the cytokine milieu following the lymphocyte infiltration lead to a suppression of viral gene expression and a shutoff of viral, uh, viral activity. Now, if we just look at what might happen following this, following regression, I guess, we've got T cells which have specificity for viral antigens, and we have some sort of system of immune surveillance. And the possibility, therefore, because the viral genome may not be effectively eliminated, viral protein expression might be put down, but viral genome maintenance in the basal layer, which is not necessarily thought to require elevated viral gene expression, the viral genome can be maintained in the epithelial basal layer for some time after lesion clearance, and following changes in immunosuppression, there's a possibility that viral reactivation might occur. Now, there's evidence for this up to a point in, rabid mod in the rabid model system in that areas where lesions used to be. So if I can uh, 
I'll try and recover it, okay. I think the basic model, I've almost to the end, so I just had one summary slide. The basic model is that during a natural infection, the virus controls its gene expression very precisely, and this ordered gene expression can lead to a productive infection. Deregulation could occur at particular epithelial sites, and in the cervix this is manifest as CIN grade 2 or CIN grade 3. Elevated levels of E6 and E7 expression can lead to neoplasia, and whether that happens from a viral episome expressing E6 and E7 at high levels, or whether it happens following integration of the viral genome into the chromosome, the effect is potentially the same, that the overexpression of E6 and E7 for long periods can lead to the accumulation of genetic errors in the host cell. I think the alternative outcome which occurs in many individuals is that the immune system notices the virus infection and clears it by a standard immune response. And hopefully Margaret and, uh, and Magnus will expand on some of these ideas in the next talk. Okay, thank you very much.